gospel lesson from Mark chapter 11, Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. As they approached Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and told them, Go into the village ahead of you. As soon as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this, say, the Lord needs it, and he will send it back here without delay. They left and found a colt on the street, tied at a door, and they untied it. Some who were standing there asked him, what are you doing untying that colt? The disciples answered them just as Jesus had instructed them, and the men let them go. They brought the colt to Jesus, threw their garments on it, and Jesus sat on it. Many people spread their garments on the road. Others spread branches that they had cut from the fields. Those who went in front and those who followed were crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. That's the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. So we'll join in the next hymn. For Palm Sunday, maybe you know something about Palm Sunday, maybe you don't know a whole lot about Palm Sunday, I, I don't know. You got a little glimpse of what happened, we had some children do an excellent job, I think very nicely and orderly come in and drop all these branches down, they came and they sang a beautiful song. They really give a good example of what happened in the gospel lesson. Jesus coming into Jerusalem right before he begins the week where some misery, agony, and finally death happens to him. And so how do we celebrate Palm Sunday? We did a nice little show here, and that was awesome by the children. We thank you for glorifying your Savior that way. We could focus on that, how the people were shouting, Hosanna to the coming Savior, Jesus. But in one of our readings from Philippians, 
from Philippians chapter 2. What the Lord does is he really lays out why you and I will shout Hosanna. What the Lord does is he lays out why you and I on this day as we get ready to celebrate all that Jesus was going to do for us, why we can absolutely rejoice. Just listen to what he says or what we're told. Indeed, let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Though he was by nature God, he did not consider equality with God as a prize to be displayed. But he emptied himself by taking the nature of a servant. When he was born in human likeness and his appearance was like that of any other man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death and death on a cross. Right there is why we are going to celebrate Palm Sunday. It is because of that humility that Jesus displayed. If I were to ask you what is humility, humility is not something where, oh, I gave a wrong answer or someone proved me wrong and now I'm, I'm humble. When we talk about the humility that Jesus displayed, it is Jesus simply not making full use of all of his power. Because who was Jesus and who is Jesus? He is God. Jesus is the one who created Adam and Eve. He is the one who breathed life into their very bodies. Jesus is the one who etched into the earth the boundaries of the ocean. Jesus, if you read the book of Colossians, we are told, holds our very lives right there in the palm of his hand, that you and I are so dependent on Jesus that we cannot even begin to breathe or blink or anything without him. When Jesus walked this earth, all he did was he stopped making full display of his power. He didn't lose it. He just didn't use it. A good example would be if a dad decides to wrestle with his five-year-old son, who is going to win? The five-year-old child. That five-year-old child will win. Why? Because that dad is going to let that child beat him up. That dad is going to let the child twist his arm, throw him on the ground, body slam him, and do whatever he wants because that dad is showing, hey, I love you. Go ahead. Beat me up. Even though at any moment that dad could stand up, pick up that child by his shirt, and do whatever he wanted to that child. Dear old dad just refrained himself. And that's what Jesus did. Now, why is that important that Jesus humbled himself? How is Jesus not making full use of his power a comfort for you? What well, starts back in that Garden of Eden? Adam and Eve. They made a choice. Adam and Eve were the first two human beings to ever walk this earth. They were the ones that God gave life to when he first formed the world. They were perfect. They were sinless. Everything was honky-dory. And then what happened? They made a choice. They made a choice to not believe God's word. They made a choice not to believe his promises. They made a choice to rebel against God when they ate that forbidden fruit. And then when they ate that forbidden fruit, they became sinful. And sinfulness was passed on to every single human being after them. You can think of one of their children, a man named Cain. He murdered his brother. Sinfulness was growing and expanding. As we enter Holy Week, we are going to see sinfulness rising as we hear of people lying, as we hear of people deceiving, as we hear of people accepting bribes, as we hear of people condemning innocent and committing murder. Sinfulness continues throughout the world. And then, and then we even look at ourselves and we see sin still today. When God created man and woman, when he created Adam and Eve, they were perfect, united in marriage. But what happened when they sinned marriage, husband and wife? Well, 
Well, guess what? There's struggle inside marriage now. That's because of sin. Husband and wife, they don't always love each other. In fact, sometimes they fight and they bicker with each other. Husband and wife, they don't always trust each other. They don't always rely on each other. Husband lets down wife. Wife disappoints husband. Tension rises inside a marriage. As each one starts to pull back and pull away and dig their heels in and say, I'm done. Sinfulness. Sinfulness is there. And then, what does God call children? Children are blessings. Children are gifts from God. I'm a parent of four, so I can say this. My children, I still love you, all four of you, but get ready. Sometimes you don't really enjoy your children. Because what happens? They're not very nice sometimes. When they're babies, what do they do? They spit up on you. When they're babies, what do they do? They poop on you. When they're sometimes four years old, what do they? They still poop on you. They cost you money. They change your bodies. They change your relationships. And it gets hard, and you got to constantly, someone told me this this morning, you are constantly making your adult schedule revolve around your child's schedule. And, oh, does that get tiring? And then what happens? Well, I don't look at you, dear child... Sorry, children, I'm going to say it a little gentler. Oh, children, you're not always this wonderful blessing. You kind of, I just want to shove you away for a minute. That's, that's sadly what some parents do. But we still love you, children, and I will prove it. You can watch me after church, hug all four of mine if they'll let me. Okay? But, but that's sinfulness. We don't look at our children anymore as being precious gifts and blessings They're sometimes just hard to deal with. And children, you're not completely innocent either because, well, you don't listen to your mom and you don't listen to your dad. You do everything, some, you do things that you really shouldn't and you fight with your siblings and sometimes horribly you fight with them. Sin, it is there for us all. And what is truly, what is truly bad is what Satan does. When he sees a husband and wife struggling, when he sees children struggling with each other and then with his parents, what does Satan like to do? Man, does he like to come in and just point out, dear child, your parents can't stand you. Dear wife, dear husband, there is no way anybody could ever love you. You are worthless. You are horrible. They'll never forgive you. You are are awful. Because what Satan wants to do is he just wants to rip and destroy your human relationships and he wants to absolutely destroy your confidence and your love in God Almighty. Sin. Those are but a few examples. And God tells us what happens The wages of sin is death from the book of Romans. The soul that sins is the one that will die. And if that was the end of it, okay, fine. I'm just nothing anymore. That'll be okay. God tells us one more thing. At the day of our death is a day of judgment for us. And God tells us, if you do not not believe, if you reject Christ, the judgment for you is separation from God. And that is something none of us at all ever wants. So now what does the humility of Jesus have to do for you? What does the humility that Jesus displayed on Palm Sunday and carried out through Holy Holy Week, how does that comfort you? What does it do for you now? Indeed. Let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Though he was by nature God, he did not consider equality with God as a prize to be displayed, but he emptied himself 
by taking the nature of a servant when he was born in human likeness and his appearance was like that of any other man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. What does that humility of Christ have to do with you? The Apostle Paul tells us clearly Jesus is God. Never did he stop being God. All power and all authority was and is and will forever be his. But what did that almighty God do? He said, okay, I will leave my throne of glory. He looked at Adam and Eve. And he said, okay, I will come into this world through the birth of the Virgin Mary. He looked at you. He said, okay, I will obey my mom and dad. I will submit myself to the governing authorities, the religious rulers. I will submit myself to Pontius Pilate in his horrible decree of death for me. God didn't have to do that. Jesus didn't have to do that. When they were mocking him and they punched him and said, hey, Jesus, who hit you? He could have said it was you and watch this and knocked him out. But what did he do? He took the beating. What did he do? He let people spit in his face. What did God Almighty do? The one who made thorns, he let that crown be put on his head and the reed beat it into his skull. What did he do? He didn't fight as they stretched him out on that cross. And he didn't shoot lightning bolts from heaven as they pounded those nails into his hands and feet. He allowed himself, humbled himself to be subject to the sinfulness of mankind so that he could for one time and forever offer himself as the atoning sacrifice, that payment for all your sins. What Jesus did by humbling himself was allowed himself to carry the weight of your sins. What he did was allowed himself to make that purchase price necessary, required, as he endured the pains of hell. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was for you guys and for me. So that when we give in to the desires of our heart, the indecencies of our thoughts. When we give in to the overindulgence of whatever substance there is out there, when we look at that word of God and say, it's foolishness, it's rubbish, I have no place for it in my life because this world is so much fun. What did Jesus do and what does he come to you with? I humbled myself. I died, and I suffered hell to free you. So that the guilt that you carry, so that the burden of sin that you are bearing, so that the shame that you feel for things you maybe have done to your spouse or to your children or children to your spouses or whatever, you can say without doubt in your heart and mind and voice, my Savior Jesus died. I am God's child. Satan, you will not have me. Death will not claim me because I am free. Because of what Jesus Christ has done. That's the beauty of Jesus humbling himself taking your place so that you can live absolutely free of sin, absolutely free of shame, absolutely comforted with knowing heaven is yours. There's one last little part that God gives us in this reading from Philippians. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. Said at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God.
the Father. Put religion aside for a minute, just a basic question. Have you ever been embarrassed ever in your life? Double thumbs up. Have you ever been proven wrong in your life? Yeah. I gave this example in first service. Uh, AI, it got me. I was on my phone one day, and it showed that, uh, that Disney Castle in Florida was on fire and destroyed. And I was like, look at this, dear. And I showed everybody, because I didn't care. And turns out it's actually not burned to the ground. I was embarrassed because we were in a public place and many people heard me say that and I was, I was, proven, I was proven wrong. It happens. Your faith in Jesus, your confidence that the Bible is actually God's word, truth that does not change, truth that gives joy and peace and comfort no matter what society says, your confidence in God's word. Have you ever felt embarrassed about it? Have you ever felt just a little bit ashamed, like, oh boy, I hope I'm not believing something goofy. Oh boy, I hope no one finds out that I believe in Jesus. Or on Monday, Thursday, when we take the Lord's Supper, body and blood, that people see me drinking that stuff and eating his body. If you've ever felt slightly embarrassed, you ever wondered, is this true? God speaks to you in those verses from Philippians chapter 2, those last two verses, where he makes that guarantee. Every knee from all time will bow before him. Whether it's bowing in faith or bowing out of submission because they realize that on the day of judgment, Judas H. Priest, I made a mistake, I'm in trouble. Every knee will bow before him and every tongue will confess with faith or the sad realization, I was wrong, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Don't be ashamed. Don't ever be embarrassed to call Jesus your Savior, to say, yeah, I follow what God says in his word. Because my Savior Jesus died for me, my Savior Jesus will give me life everlasting. And that is how we can, with the children this morning, come in here singing, rejoicing, and praising God for everything that he has done for you. Amen.